coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Well, I don't know how many I really I, I currently have. I know it's a lot. Look at that. I've got over 300 total records. Longhorn Cavern State Park is one of the most unique places in the state of Texas. You get that wax all the way around there. They always say the purple ones are the fastest. <laughs> Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. I'm gonna go try what, some cast out here to see if I can get any bass that may have gone out over there. There we go. Get out there now. Got him, got him. Good fish here, real good fish. The bass gotta be a bass. Whoa, whoa. Whoa, look at that. Big Rio, big Rio. Gentlemen, we may possibly have something over two pounds. Meet Chuck Dewey. Look at this. Chuck likes to fish a lot, but he doesn't go fishing for just any fish. Chuck goes fishing for records. 1.45. Wow. 1.45. That fish was caught in October there's a good chance he'd go over two pounds. Got a few of the records I've caught over the years. and some of these A visit to Chuck's home just records, outside uh, of San Antonio, records, Texas, yeah. is there's kind of like a visit to the Chuck Dewey Fishing Hall of Fame. Plaques, awards, certificates, and fish mounts are the decor of choice. This one here is the war moth for Live Oak City Lake. Uh, that was caught on July the 13th, 2012. And that is still the current record. That record is just one of many that Chuck has as part of the state's angler recognition program. Catch a big fish, and you too could get your name in the record books. Everybody can get recognition through this program in some way or another. You can catch a water body record. You can catch um, a state record. You can catch your first fish. You can get a record by weight, or you can get a record by length. You can get a record for different tackles, different types of fishing, different methods of catches. Oh, that's a good bass. One of the cool things about it is, you know, whether somebody gets the record or doesn't get the record, they're always excited about fishing. Oh, got a good one, Chuck. Good fish, good fish. People call it perch jerkin, uh, brim fishing, whatever. Oh yeah, big old red ear. Big old fat red ear. I would rather catch a 10 plus inch red ear than a 10 pound largemouth bass. That's just me. Chuck spent 37 years as a police officer chasing bad guys. The story you are about to see is true. Got him. Now that he's retired, he spends his days chasing big fish. These are all trophy fish here. Every one of them. It's early June, and Chuck is fishing one of his favorite spots, the West Nueces River, north of Brackettville. There it is. Got him. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on, buddy. There he is. I love the bank fish. I love to keep it simple. Another big old female right here. I don't have to worry about uh, cleaning a boat or charging batteries or anything like that. I just throw my gear in, and I'm gone. Big old slabs. Yeah, beautiful day for fishing. I like to catch bass. They're pretty good fighters. Chuck's here with Leo and Yesenia Flores. <laughs> they all fish here on a regular basis. And between the three of them, they have 11 West Nueces River records. Uh, I met Leo and Yesenia off a fishing forum. Beautiful bass. Uh, we got to become pretty good friends. Lo and behold, they like getting records also. Yesenia's got the weight record. Oh, yes. That's more important than the record or even fishing is just the people you meet. Get a quick picture of him holding this fish. And that's going to be the catch and release pending largemouth bass record. West Nueces River by Leo Flores. Pretty nice fish. Thank you, Mr. Bass. 
All right, here's where it happened. The Angler Recognition Program is not just for adults. Oh my God. There is a separate division just for junior anglers. Oh, it's about dang time. Gavin McKeska is one of those junior angler record holders. He's a member of the Wall High School fishing team, so he's out on the water a lot. In the spring of 2019, Gavin was fishing the Oak Creek Reservoir with his dad. We go around this one dock and see a huge bass. I tossed one of my baits at it. I scared it and went under the boat. I was nervous I wasn't going to catch it. I ended up catching it. So I remember looking at the fish and I'm thinking to myself, man, she's huge. She's big. Gavin, in the meantime, he was running around hooping, hollering, and having just a ball. About jumped in the water. I was so happy. What he caught was a 26 and 3 quarter inch largemouth bass. At 13.6 pounds, it set both the junior angler and all ages record for Oak Creek. One of the best moments of my life. I'm just saying this now, I think I'm gonna become famous. Bluegill. Ron Smith runs the angler recognition program. Nice one. In a typical year, he'll get about 1,500 applications for record fish. That works out to about 125 each month, or 29 applications every week. Chuck Dewey's, that's a nice one, Rio Grande Cichlid. He sends me about four to five applications a month. He's like a regular at a restaurant, comes in almost every day. <laughs> a big fish award and a water body record. Once I get validation, I will print out the certificate that has their name on it, a little gold star, and then we mail them out. Last month, I processed 240 certificates. We do that right here. This is pretty much the, the factory. <laughs> definitely, definitely over half a pound. Since I hold the record, I'm not gonna beat my own record, I don't think, so we'll throw it back. You're not selfish? No. What we're really trying to do is stress the importance and the availability of angling, get more people out there and more friendly competition. And Booyah. Everybody likes to brag about their fish. <laughs> and then you got the green sunfish. Well, I don't know how many I really I, I currently have. I know it's a lot. It's in the 200 range for current records, but I've got over 300 total records. You remember the Rio Grande cichlid Chuck caught at the beginning of the story? It did qualify for the West Nueces River weight record. Glad to get him back in the water. I don't know, he may not ever get caught again, but who knows? Just another day, another big fish for a guy who has a record number of records. Got him. Now, the reason why I do this kind of fishing is plain and simple. It's uh, enjoyable. Each time I go out, it's just the enjoyment of walking up to that bank and seeing that nice still water in front of you and wondering what's in it. A record is just icing on the cake. Oh, got him. And if I don't catch a record, it doesn't mean anything uh, at all. I'll keep fishing. To find out more about the Angler Recognition Program, go to tpwd.texas.gov slash fish records. There you'll find links to current records, official weigh stations, and rules on how to weigh, measure, and photograph your fish for submission. Longhorn Cavern State Park is one of the most unique places in the state of Texas. We are the only publicly accessible cavern in the state of Texas that was largely formed by the work of an underground river. We have literally centuries of Texas-sized stories that took place right here within the park and largely within the cavern itself. I can think of really nowhere else in Texas where you can walk in the footsteps of Civil War era bat guano miners, nuclear fallout shelter survivors, underground 
dancers and live entertainment from the 1930s. All of it happening right here in Longhorn Cavern. And you can learn all about it on a cavern walking tour almost every single day of the year. Geologists believe that the rocks that surround this cave are about 500 million years old. But the cave itself is relatively young, just a few million years old. And so we still have a lot of growing left to do here. Watch your head, your tall ones, because it does get low right here for a second. So I'm going to show you one of the bats we have in our cave. They're called tricolor bats. They are the second smallest bat in North America, and we call them the chicken nuggets of the cave because in full-grown adult, they are about the size of chicken nuggets. We are one of the best places in Texas to be able to get up close to bats and really admire these interesting creatures at a distance and a, a level of depth that you just don't get other places. There's more to do here than just see the cave. We have over a mile of walking trails, plenty of green space, picnic areas, lots of things to do here. Longhorn Cavern State Park opened uh, Thanksgiving Day of 1932, but in 1934 things really started to change when the Civilian Conservation Corps arrived to begin a formal excavation and development of the park. The CCC removed over 3,000 dump truck loads of debris the CCC, when they came in to uh, remove the debris, all the work they did was all done by hand. There was no machinery that was actually inside the cave. They removed everything with 50-gallon uh, buckets, 5-gallon buckets, shovels, pickaxes. They used levers up top to pull it out of the sinkholes that we have in the cave. They installed our first lighting systems. They laid down the first trail surfaces. They built Park Road 4 uh, up above ground, and they also built some of the beautiful CCC era buildings that we have here on the property. There's really a lot for visitors to take in, and the historical significance of what the CCC did here is pretty amazing. Anybody scared to go down there? Uh. Longhorn Cavern offers a more adventurous tour um, called the Wild Cave Tour. You crawl around in the dirt. It's not uncommon to get in the water. You're crawling through uh, tunnels that are very low. Ow! At the Wild Cave Tour, you're crawling on your hands and knees, army crawling on your bellies, and all you have is one little light on your head. I'll take you down a three hour ad adventure you'll never forget. Longhorn Cavern State Park makes a great day trip. If you're looking to come out into the hill country to explore some of the diverse topographies that we have in the hill country, we're a natural stopping point on any hill country itinerary. There are 30 or so different species of birds that spend most of their days along Texas beaches and bays. From the greater yellowlegs and American avocet to the piping plover, these are all shorebirds. With both development and beachgoers on the rise, the birds face serious challenges. From a loss of nesting habitat to the daily struggle for space on the beach. But these birds have allies. And the sandalings are really aggressive. There are sentinels of the shoreline all along the coast. The birds have picked through a lot of this. These are all folks you'll Let's meet. See, looks like we've got a banded plover down here by the water's edge. Who are working to protect these Texas treasures, collectively known as shorebirds. It's somewhat repetitive, but here we go. So, sandaling, sandaling, flapping gull, um, ruddy turnstone, a little bit there, sandaling. For three decades, Tony Amos has counted the number of shorebirds along a seven-mile stretch of beach on Mustang Island. Sandaling, 246840, 246850, 246860. 
You've heard of addictions, oh, five, six, right? 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> I'm addicted to counting things. <laughs> Using an old Hewlett Packard computer from the 1980s, he's counting birds and people. So we have people two, dogs two. Tony's study looks at the boom in beachgoers and their impact on the birds. They are constantly disturbed just by strolling on the beach. And it's a day-to-day -day thing that the birds have to uh, endure. Many of these birds have migrated thousands of miles from their nesting grounds in the Arctic, and once they're here, they need to rest or loaf. They're not feeding, they're just there. They're often in communities of mixed groups of birds, and they need to loaf just the same way that we need to, to relax every now and again. See, I, I hate that. Unleashed dogs are another big stressor for the birds and for Tony. These are migratory species, they're actually protected. Um, and the dog is chasing them and disturbing them in a, in a very aggressive way. And some of these birds at certain times of the year have just crossed the whole ocean and they're absolutely exhausted. Hello. You know, your dog should be on a leash. He's, ch he's chasing the birds and um, these birds are, are migrants that have come in for well, I, I know I'm not unsympathetic to what he needs, but it's, the, it's also the law. As Tony's research wraps up his 30th year, he continues to keep a close eye on the threatened piping plover. I need to see if they got bands. Which spends over half of the year here on the Texas coast. He goes along and he moves his foot on the wet sand, and then he pecks over here. And he moves this foot and he pecks over here. And I've never quite decided why he does that. Maybe it can detect these animals underneath its foot, but it's quite remarkable. So they're just uh, amazing birds. They're well worth preserving. And if we don't preserve it, it's another fascinating thing and part of nature that we will lose. Like the piping plover, all shorebirds have voracious appetites as they store up fat reserves for their yearly migration. And many of the tiny invertebrates the birds feed on live in a seaweed called sargassum. Sargassum is a brown algae. It's got everything that they can use. John Adams and other biologists want to change the mentality of what a beach should look like. While this is a typical postcard shot, this is what the birds need. There's a nudibranch right there. That's a mollusk that doesn't have a shell. There's a shrimp right there. Can you see him? It's just a whole ecosystem right here. The idea is to leave the seaweed as opposed to scraping it off with a front loader. And that's just the case at Padre Island National Seashore, south of Corpus Christi. Padre Island National Seashore protects one of the longest stretches of undeveloped barrier islands in the world. We have sanderlings, we have long-billed curlews, we have the piping plovers, uh, we have Wilson's plovers. Uh, ruddy turnstone is another species. Can you see that running around in the sargasm quite a bit? But the sargasm plays an important role for these birds that call this place home. Further down the coast at South Padre Island, a beach city that survives on tourism, they too have changed their attitude about seaweed. We are taking efforts to work more with Mother Nature. They use the sargassum to prevent erosion. This is a good example here of one of the areas that we are trying to restore the dunes by using sargassum deposits that have been washing up on shore. And at South Padre, gone are the practices of beach clearing every day. I think that our tourists are going to appreciate that fact once they're educated and know why we're doing this, why we're not grooming those beaches every day. Here and elsewhere, coastal cities are changing the image of what a typical Texas beach should look like. It's a sales package, a change in perception. The tourists don't ask that they scrape up all the pine needles in the national forest, or they don't ask them to mow all the grass in the meadow at Yellowstone. Why would they ask to remove the sargassum from the beach?
strike slammed into the Texas coast early this morning, and now the search, rescue, and recovery begins. Oh, God, look at that. In 2008, Texas beaches were hammered by Hurricane Ike, destroying homes and habitat, not only displacing people, but shorebirds as well. What we've been able to find is that a number of the birds that were located along the upper Texas coast where it was severely impacted have in fact moved further down the coast south. Funded by Texas Parks and Wildlife, Ben Wardwell is searching the beaches of the upper coast on the lookout for plovers. Here we go. I think I was over here down by the water. This is another one of our common winter residents here. This is a black-bellied plover. This project I'm working on right now is studying a group of birds called the sand plovers, which include the Wilson's plover, the snowy plover, and the piping plover is the main focus of our survey. Ben discovered that the hurricane actually had some positive effects as it created new habitat. One thing I'm seeing after the hurricane is a lot of new tidal cuts have opened where backwater areas that have initially were isolated now have cuts that reach all the way to the Gulf, providing an intermingling zone of fresh and salt water, which is highly productive for shorebirds. Any and all efforts we make, particularly here on their wintering grounds, are going to have a positive and prolonged effect on their ability to reestablish themselves as a species. Tony's study on Mustang Island and Ben's survey of plovers have one common thread. No matter the species, shorebirds here in Texas need their space. One of the things that we can do here on the coast to turn it around is really be aware of what their habitat needs are and just be respectful of them. There is a way perhaps of being aware. I think many people are really oblivious to birds. They're, they're such a part of the, um, the background noise, if you like, that people don't uh, really notice. So I'd like people to be a little bit more aware. Maybe step around them a little bit, take a look for a while. My name's Wade. And this is what it's like to do some sand surfing at the Monaghan Sand Hills State Park. Ready? <laughs> Let's give it a shot. Man, look at that view. You can see some jackrabbit tracks, and you can see the little beetles, the dune beetles. You get that wax all the way around there. You can rent these at the Dunnigan Visitor Center. They always say the purple ones are the fastest. Wow. <laughs> We need elevators. Oh, mercy. <laughs> Get too old for this. That's what it's like, sand surfing at the Monaghan Sand Hill State Park. <laughs>